Hey, I am honored to be here tonight. Like uh, Scott said, I'm Stephen Stern. I'm the pastor at Walnut Grove Christian Church. Yeah, close enough. I'm sure there's a creek somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we're in Arcola, gateway to the Amish. Uh, not, a, not a bad place to be. Um, I, I, there's never a bad time to open up God's Word. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be... Last month you were in Galatians chapter 5. Tonight we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. And I get to share with you a ministry that God has placed on my heart called God Will Make Away Ministries. Uh, This adoption ministry is new, but I I thought recently, looked back at my life and realized that adoption's actually been part of my life for a long time. My parents were both in the Navy. My dad retired after 22 years of service, and his last station was Naval Air Station Fallon, Nevada. And I can tell you that was pretty cool. It was home of Top Gun, still is. And the only problem my brother and I ran into living in Nevada is we found out really quickly that there were exactly zero professional sports teams. Zero. And so 1,877 miles from Chicago, Illinois, we adopted the Chicago Bulls as our team. Right? And and just because they had this guy who could play a little bit uh, named Michael Jordan. Have you guys heard of him? Now, he's mainly a, a baseball player and an actor, But he moonlight, made a little bit in basketball uh, after Space Jam, right? Uh, Didn't do too badly. Six NBA championships, five MVPs. And he's the impetus for actually one of the greatest post-game moments of all time. See, one game against the Cleveland Cavaliers, 90-91 season, he went off for 69 points in a game. Career high. Amazing. His rookie teammates... Stacy King got into the game late, got fouled, made one of the free throws. And so after the game, all the reporters were just buzzing around Jordan. Michael, right? Michael, Michael, Michael. But Stacy King got the best one-liner of all. He said, I'll always remember this as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> Not a bad night, right? The Habit podcast declared that the most interesting word that Stacey King said that night was the word and. It was the, the grammatical slipperiness that allowed Stacey Ronald King to somehow seem like an equal to his heiress MJ when they were anything but equals. See, I'm sharing with you tonight what could be called a, a Stacey King ministry. My my wife and I are starting this adoption ministry, and we are trying to take the court with the goat, the greatest of all time. We're trying to advocate for millions of kids all over the world and for the hundreds of thousands of couples that want to welcome them into their home. But in another way, this is no Stacey King ministry. Because we know without a doubt that we are not equals with God. There is no theological slipperiness with here. There is only God who makes the way, not us. And so this evening, to see the power of adoption, to see a God who is at work, whether at Little Galilee or around the world, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to zoom in on verses 4 through 7. And here's the background. Here's what's going on here is you have a people who've come to Christ. They've put on the Jesus jersey. They've taken the court with God. And somewhere along the line, the theological slipperiness began. They started to think, okay, we're we're doing this. We're combining with Jesus. We're somehow earning something alongside Jesus. There's a group called the the Judaizers. They say, okay, if you want Jesus, go through the Mosaic Law. Go to the Mosaic Law to get the Christian faith. Now, with a group of guys here, we could probably describe it differently. How many of you guys like Taco Bell? No one. Great. This illustration is going to do great. How many of you guys like McDonald's? Even less. No. This would be like saying, okay, I love Taco Bell, and someone says, great, every time you want to go to Taco Bell, you just have to go through the McDonald's drive-thru first. And you say, well, I I don't like McDonald's. I like Taco Bell. And they say, that's great. Go through McDonald's drive-thru, and then you can get your Taco Bell. And Paul says, not so fast. He's talking to this group of people that we could call the Jesus and group. They're always trying to say, Jesus and us. Jesus and the law. Jesus and our works. This is the first big controversy in the early church. 
just a few months before Acts chapter 15 in Jerusalem Council. But Paul is going to get there first. He takes pen to paper, and he takes the first two chapters, and he tells us about his credibility. Chapter 3, he takes on their heirs directly. And then chapter 4, where we're going tonight, he reminds us of the unquestionable power of adoption. He's going to remind us that the actual, the gospel is adoption. And he's going to push back so that the very first verse of chapter 5 can ring true. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Let, let that be our, our call tonight. Let us be free. Let, let us be free. Let's fulfill the work of Christ freely. Let us work with him powerfully. Let us take the court with the goat and watch as he does what we could never do. Let's partner our lives to his plan. So here's Paul's first pushback. He's going to take on this idea of Jesus and the law. Yes, Lord, speak. We're listening. <laughs> Here's what Paul says, verse 4. But when that set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. I love this. Jesus Christ comes at the perfect time, doesn't he? He comes during a time of Pax Romana, of Roman peace. He comes when there's Roman roads that unite the empire so evangelists can go out with the gospel message. He comes during a time where there's Koine Greek and everyone knows this common language. He comes at the perfect time. And he comes for those of us who are condemned by the law, every single one of us, that we might receive adoption to sonship, to redeem those under the law See, Paul's response to Jesus and is Jesus only. And he's saying only Jesus can take on the old covenant that condemns us. Only Jesus can take on human flesh, fully God and fully man. Only Jesus. All to redeem us. Now that's a word we got to draw close to tonight. See, to redeem means to obtain or to set free by paying a price. Now the question we have to ask is what is the price that God is willing to pay to liberate us? Paul answers the question in chapter 3. He said Jesus was willing to take on the curse of a tree. Jesus was willing to be crucified, to be separated from God, to be condemned as a common criminal, to be spit on and beaten and spears through his side. Jesus was willing to take it all on to redeem you and to redeem me. Jesus was willing to pay the cost. And in that place of paying the cost, it took slaves and it made sons and daughters. It, it took orphans and gave us a forever home. So I want you to remember tonight that the gospel is adoption. And adoption is costly. It costs God a lot. And the truth is that for the families all over the country and the world who want to adopt, adoption is costly too. And it's not just in money, it's in it's in everything. It's in stress. It's in paperwork. It's anxiety. Uh, a lot of families who are adopting are kind of living the binder life is what I call it. Now, my wife and I, we've adopted twice. We adopted our son from Springfield, Illinois in 2013 and our, our three daughters from Columbia in 2018. And I'll tell you, living the binder life, you can just see the people coming because they're holding this binder and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go through the process. There's the immigration paperwork and the, the home study and the physical evaluation and the mental evaluation and the financial check. Forests get cut down sometimes trying to fill up this binder. It's wild. And the binder life just keeps building and the stress keeps going on. And that's part of the reason I want to give you two percentages tonight. Let's see if it's up here. Yeah, this is the one that always gets me. This is the percentage of Christian couples that said they would like to adopt. This is the number that have been able to. Now when I see a gap like that, I start to ask questions. Why the gap? And what people say is, well, I'm scared. It costs so much. The average adoption, the range I give is it costs somewhere between $20,000 and $60,000 for an adoption. Remember, the gospel is adoption. 
And adoption is costly. Paul wants us to know that, but he's not going to stop there. In fact, he's going to keep pushing. He's going to keep giving us a hope of the true gospel in the face of Judaizers. Dig back into scripture with me. Here's verse 6. Paul's going to say, wait a second, for those of you who want to be Jesus and works, he's like, here's what I got for you. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba. What a beautiful hope that we have in an Abba. There's this legal status that changes, and there's this relational status that changes. The legal status change is he says, guess what? You guys are now sons. And being a son in the first century world meant that you now had a place. You weren't a slave. You now had a standing in the family. You weren't just working hourly. Man, you had an inheritance coming. Being a son, he says, happens, though, because of this relational change. And Paul uses this Aramaic term. He says, you now have an Abba. And some people says that means daddy or dad or father. We can debate that later. But I think there's two big things that come together for us to understand Abba. The first is intimacy. Maybe you guys remember seeing this picture. It's a fantastic picture. JFK's at the desk, and there's little John John underneath the desk playing, and there was, I'm guessing, no secret service pat down. John, John, get over here. Any weapons on you, little kid? No. Or you think they were saying, listen, you get two and a half minutes with the President of the United States. He's like, no, this is my dad, man. I'm going to hang out under his desk, and I'm going to play here. He said, you may call him Mr. President, but I call him Daddy. Intimacy. The other side of this is obedience. Like I said, I got four kids now, and we're in the stage of life where we're trying to teach them to ride their bicycle. Remember that? And I, I'm very, very articulate when it comes to trying to get my kids to ride bikes. I run next to the bike and I yell in all of my articulateness. I say, pedal, 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 please. And my daughter, it's amazing, she'll hear me. I, I mean, I'm pretty clear with it, pedal. Please pedal. And her feet don't move. And she falls as I try to catch her, but my running, I run out pretty quick. And she says, Daddy, what happens? See, I could yell all night, but until my words go from my mouth to her brain and to her feet, it doesn't matter, does it? Jesus tries to teach us this obedience. He gives us the the Abba prayer. Our Abba in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What I want you to know is that the gospel is adoption. Adoption is costly. But that when that cost is paid by someone else, we call it grace. See, so often in this, this journey of adoption, man, I hear people talk and they say things like this. They say, man, I would love to adopt. In fact, we came home from our adoption and we told people our story and I I shared, man, gospel, adoption, here's what God's doing. And they said, we would love to adopt, but. Guys, this is the Sir Mix-a-Lot but that keeps getting in the way of adoptions. Big but. I'll just pop and top all over here. And that big but is so problematic, it gets in the way of what God desires, the call for God. But there's also, as people talk and lay out that big butt, what I hear them talk about is what they can do. Their bank account, their networks, their power, their ability, and oftentimes they say, oh, I don't have enough. I can't get to that price tag. But that's not the gospel, is it? It's not what we do, it's what God has done. It's not us standing alone, independent. It's us as the church, interdependent. You go through the Bible and you find adoption is God's grace. Man, he calls Moses out of those waters from an infanticidal Pharaoh. He calls Israel this nation that's small, a bunch of slaves, and he makes them a people. Jesus is willing to be adopted into Joseph's home. Man, he says, you guys, all of you, as broken as you are, welcome to the family. Let me graft you in to the family line. He says, I have a place for you. Not what you've done, but what I've done. See, that's the birthplace of God will make away ministries. 
where the idea and the vision is simple. This is what if churches like yours, what if churches like mine, what if we linked arms and we said, listen, we're in this post Roe versus Wade world. We're in this world where we claimed we are pro-life for so long and been accused of being pro-birth for so long. And we say, you know what? We're ready to put our money where our mouth is. We're ready to step up and step into the breach. We're ready to be Ezekiel 22 people and be gap standers and say, not on my watch. You're not getting through here. And as we link arms, we start to give. Here's the idea. We start to give generously, consistently, and powerfully to adoption grants. And we start to give these grants to the sustaining church partners that gave them. And a church partner here supports a church partner over here. And as we get this network of churches that says, I'm in, and I'm on board, and I want to help, we start to watch as the kingdom is built. We talk a lot about revival, don't we? We talk a lot about discipleship, don't we? Well, here's my idea. Discipleship starts at home. Discipleship builds from the home into the church, but it starts at home. It starts with parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. It starts with us doing what we're called to do. And so my challenge for us is that we would step into the gap. Now, I'm just one guy. Now, I'm a tall dude, but just one guy. And you say, I, I don't know you, Stephen. You're kind of goofy, and that's true. I can't do everything, neither can you. But what I know is that each of us can do something. Each of us can do something. See, Paul's going to build, I think, maybe the most important message of all. He says, listen, the gospel is about the partnership of Jesus and you, Jesus and me. Verse 7, he says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Mm, it's good to be a son, isn't it? It's good to be a son. Paul confirms this in Romans chapter 8. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gets a little excited and he, he says, listen, you've obtained an inheritance and you're chosen and you're claimed as God's own possession. He says, man, it is good to be a son. And what are we an heir to? You ever asked that question? Man, we're heirs of a, a new heaven and new earth. Right? This kainos, this restored heaven and earth. And then we are heirs of this agape community. Guys, I watched you downstairs. I even took a picture of you downstairs, eating together and fellowshipping together and making jokes together and talking about life together. This is the agape community that we get to be a part of where we say, you know what? I got your back and you get my back. You know, you have a problem, it's my problem. You have a victory, it's my victory. You have to go to war, I'm going to go with you. And that brotherhood, that community, we get to be an heir to the agape love that Jesus shows on us. But I also want to challenge you. See, we're also heirs to a promise. Abraham is given a promise from God in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 that through his line, all families on earth would be blessed. Now, the beauty is that that's fulfilled in Christ, but it's also passed on to us as his hands and feet, as his body, as Jesus is the head of the church. Our call is to be a blessing to every single family on earth without fail. It's quite a challenge. And I'll be honest with you guys, I've been pastoring for about 10 years. I know this youthful face, it's hard to imagine. That was a joke. And I never had some grand vision of starting a nonprofit. I didn't want to give the state of Illinois my information. But here's the thing. I, I look back and I see that God has been preparing me for something like this before I even was thinking of it. We've done the domestic adoption. We've done an international adoption, a sibling adoption, a special needs adoption. And then I go back further to a night in junior high when the phone rang on a, a Friday night and I elbowed my twin brother out of the way, like a little hip check. It was kind of a big deal to get to answer the phone, I guess. And, and I grabbed that phone and on the other end was a young woman. She said her name was Reagan. About 18 or 19 years old. And I started talking to Reagan and she said she was looking for her, her birth mom. And I was, I was confused that didn't make any sense to me. But I listened a little bit more. And she shared that 
her birth mom was my mom, who at 19 years old had gotten pregnant, wasn't married and wasn't sure what to do and had to decide in that moment, do I choose an abortion or do I choose life? Scared at 19, man. She wasn't sure what to do at 19. But thankfully, man, she chose life and this couple in Florida, these Christ followers in Florida said, yes, we'll take her. And I got to flip to, uh, not at the end of her story, but farther in her story and watch as God had raised up this young, beautiful woman who loved God and was getting a college degree and would get married and have kids and live this fruitful life because my mom chose life and this couple said, yes. See, I wonder, what are the stories that are going to be told when the church says yes to this cultural moment? Guys, what I know is that the church is made for moments like this. You go back in history, you find the Carthage Plague, man, and every doctor in town, what, it's like a Southwest commercial. They just wanted to get away. They didn't want anything to do with the plague. But Christians, they started calling them gamblers because they risked everything to go out into the street and care for people. The Roman first century world, man, they had no problem getting rid of babies they didn't want. Left them out in the, the trash heaps exposing them to the conditions, letting animals drag off little babies. But the Christians said, not now, not here, not with us. And so they go out there and they take these little babies and they'd raise them as their own. Guys, we were made for a moment like this. We were made for the cultural reckoning that we're in now. We've been made for the prayers that are going on for 50 years. This is our chance. This is our opportunity. And there's power when we say yes to God, there's power. See, God will make away ministries. We want to model on an earthly plane what's happening on a spiritual plane. Like I said, we believe discipleship starts at home, so we want to help children find their forever home and in the process find Jesus. And we want to help them find Jesus in your church and in my church and every church across America and across North America and across the world. We want churches to take seriously James 1.27, not just preach it, but live it pure and faultless religion. Let's see it. Let's see it, church. Let's live it. I'm thinking about a, a couple in their 40s. They just came home today with four children, sibling group from the Philippines. They found out that the gospel was adoption. And adoption is costly. But when that cost is paid by another, it's called grace. I'm thinking about a couple in Charleston, Illinois, Sam and Kara, who are adopting soon a special needs child, probably from Bulgaria. And what they're going to find is that the gospel is adoption, and adoption is costly, yes, but when that cost is paid by another, what do we call it, guys? Grace. You guys can do better. What do we call it? Grace. Yeah. You guys are good. You guys are good at this. And I'm thinking about couples whose names I don't know, but that you do. I'm thinking about couples in your church, in your community, in your area, who need to know that the gospel is adoption. Who need to know, yes, adoption is costly, but when that cost is paid by another, we call it grace. grace. So tonight, in the second half of my sermon here, just kidding. This is, this is the first third. Hey, guy in the salmon shirt. I told you I was going to throw you under the bus. Tonight, let me end with just a, a bold plea. And, and I'll be bold because I think God leaves a bold call on our life to care for the orphans around the world. The 20 million right now around the world and in the United States who are ready to be adopted. I got a, a sign-up sheet up here. I'd love to be able to share with you our, our newsletter and what's going on in the ministry. I'd love for you to consider being an advocate in your congregation. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm not in a place of life where I want to adopt. My wife would, but I, I'm not in a place. But maybe I know people who want to. And then when you consider helping be the person who opens the gate to your congregation, Will you help me talk to your missions team and share the ministry? Will you help me sit down with someone who has the power to say yes? Will you give me the opportunity 
to advocate in your neck of the woods? Will you link arms with us? Will you go church for church, man to man, church family with adoptive family, and say, yes, this is the time. This is why we're here. This is why we've been made. Tonight, I'd love to get a chance to talk to you after and share some information if you're willing. And I'd love to see what happens when we say yes. You know, MJ and Stacy Ronald King weren't equals. But together, they did score 70 points. And even though God does all the work of saving, when we say yes to him and we take the court, we still get to be part of a once-in-a-lifetime, amazing, never-to-be-gotten opportunity to watch the GOAT, the greatest of all time, make a way where there seemed to be no way. Guys, this is our time. I'm going to pray for you, and then I love, like I said, I got some information up here. I'll lay it out, and you guys can fight over it, be gentle with each other. We talked about grace tonight. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, you're a God who thinks bigger than we do oftentimes. You're a God who's worked across the worlds and across the centuries and across cultures. God, we've heard tonight how you're, you're working through little Galilee, Lord, and I just praise you for that. My kids are getting excited to go this next week. Lord, I pray that every child in our communities and our churches would get to experience the life change that can come through camp. But Father, I also hope on the other side that we as the church are reaching our arms out wide and far and help pulling kids into our community. That the next time someone says, you Christians are just pro-birth, we say, no, 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 no. We have a God who's pro-life. We have a God who's doing amazing things and he's doing it through us, his church. And so Father, I, I don't know what you have in store for us exactly, but I'm excited to watch you work. I'm excited to say yes to you, Lord. Let that be the passion of our hearts. Let that be the call on our lives. And Lord, as scary as it may be, let us just settle for yes in you. Lord, I pray this all because of what Jesus has done on the cross and the empty tomb that he left in his resurrection. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.